Okay, everyone, I am with Jessica, who is a wildlife rehabilitator. What uh, kind of animals have you worked with over the period of time? Oh, so um, I've worked with lots of different species. I've worked all over the East Coast. Um, and so primarily right now we're doing songbirds and small mammals. So we do like um, gray squirrels, flying squirrels, uh, Virginia opossums, um, and then like I said, the smaller songbirds. So. so today I was so fortunate. A friend told me, about Jessica and uh, I took who I thought was Mary in uh, for emergency care and I'll let you go ahead and update. Yeah, so when we got in um, Mary, um, he unfortunately has already passed away, but he is definitely an older possum. He looks like he had been attacked by some form of predator. Um, he was already immune compromised before that, so he was older and looks like he's been thin and a little malnutritioned. He's probably been struggling finding his own food just because he gets a little older and the teeth get worn down. Um, and then, you know, after he's got a couple bite wounds. Um, so after all that, unfortunately, he's already passed away. Um, but he was very comfortable beforehand, so at least he was going to be helped. And he wasn't laying out there suffering um, while he was in pain or discomfort. So, oh, good. Yeah. Good. Do you have any recommendations, like if someone finds an animal by the side of the road oh, or yeah. whatever? What would be your thought as a professional in this? What do you do? What do you? What would you carry with you in the yeah. car? So um, I always have. Sorry about the noise. I um, I always travel with at least a large towel. Uh -huh. um, so that's like kind of the minimum for me. Um, I also like to carry um, garden gloves, like a small pair of garden gloves, a towel. And then if you have access to like a cardboard box that you can collapse and make space in your vehicle, that's perfect too. Sometimes awesome. that's hard to have. Okay. Um, and then I also always carry hot hands. So the, the little pads that you can kind of open the package and warm up. Um, oh. And that's mostly for babies. So like if you find a small bird or like with these guys, with these possums, I always check every possum you ever find. One, you never know if they're actually passed away or if they're playing possum by the road. And two, especially this time of year, moms usually have babies. So even if she's passed away, there could be babies in her pouch um, and they're nursing on her, whether she's alive or not. And so they can be getting septic and sick. Um, so the hot hands are great for them. So if you find them, you pull them out, put them in the soft towel or tissue or whatever, and then put the heating pad under that to help keep them warm because they can't self-regulate. Um, same thing for small birds. So small birds that don't have any feathers also need that kind of warmth because they can't regulate. So I always gotcha. travel with hot hands. So that's always a big key. Hot so, hands. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. So you can buy them on Amazon. That's where I get them in a box and I just carry a couple in my car. So. Wonderful, yeah. wonderful. Is there anything that the people can do to protect themselves that you would recommend? Yeah, so the biggest thing, of course, with mammals is just making sure that, you know, you're, you stay away from their head. Um, so you try not to get bit and then using the towel to just kind of throw it over them and scoop them up and then put them in the container that you're going to be using. Um, always call if you have any questions, if you feel uncomfortable, um, so you can always call somebody else and ask them, you can always call me too. Um, and then um, I can try to talk through that if I can help it. And then of course being careful with rabies specter species because that's, it is prominent here in North Carolina, so just use caution. So. Do possums carry rabies? So it's uncommon for a possum to have rabies um, because their body temperature is normally too low for the virus. There are some um, exceptions to that would be mm. one who is sick. So if he's sick and he has a fever, then he mm. is potential for it. But again, very uncommon. So there's not normally that fear with them like there is like, unfortunately, you know, things like raccoons and foxes um, and coyotes. They are rabies vector species, so there it's, a, it's more prominent in those species than others. So, and legally speaking, if we uh, find an animal like a, a wild wildlife, is it we we need to try to contact a wildlife rehabilitator? Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, um, it is illegal in North Carolina to keep these guys um, and to try to take care of them in your home or keep them as a pet. Um, so always reach out for help. It's also, they're so different. Each yes. species is different. It's very important to, to know what you're dealing with and to know how to properly handle them or get them to a rehab or what to feed them. So um, there's a license for that here in North Carolina. There's also a federal license as well, especially for migratory birds. Um, so always reaching out. There's some great groups locally in our area. So if you're talking about Cabarrus County in general, um, there's the Carolina Waterfowl down near Indian yes. Trail. Um, there's the Carolina Wildlife Sanctuary, which is who I work with. 
and then there's ARC, which is Animal Rehabbers of the Carolinas, and they're kind of all over in our area. They're they're like a team of rehabbers, um, and so they're great for mammals. And so, and then of course the Raptor Center. Sorry, I didn't mean to not no, tell them that's too. So wonderful. That's the Carolina Raptor Center, and they're over in Huntersville, um, and they do primarily those big birds. So they're doing your raptors. So I really appreciate yeah. everything that you are doing for. <laughs> these creatures that are many times misunderstood oh, and in yeah. emergency situations and we don't really yeah. know what to do to help care for yeah. them. Uh, there was one other question I had for you that seemed important and That's it okay. eluded my mind I believe. Let me just one more second sure. here. Um, oh if someone wanted to become a wildlife rehabilitator is that is that uh, if you go to school how do you learn to become? So um, for mammals it's, um, it's a little bit the licensing is mostly just for the state. Um, my best recommendation is with ARC. Okay. So Animal Rehabbers of the Carolina offers a class every year where they go through all of that for at least like those beginning, like, you know, most people kind of start off doing like your squirrels and your possums um, and your bunnies. And so that's a great class and they're a great resource um, and they will kind of help you get that first permit. Um, so when you become a permanent rehabber, you now start off in North Carolina with an apprenticeship. I was trying to give a word. So you, yes. you actually work under a licensed rehabber for one year before you can get your permit. Wonderful. Yeah. So do you um, have a lot of people taking the program? Yeah. Is there a lot? Of, I think so. I'm not, you know, I've never taken it with them, but my understanding is that I think they get quite a few people every year that take the class. I don't know what they're doing this year because yes. of the pandemic so it might be different but i would you know i would just check and call with them and find out Thank what they're doing you. so maybe they're doing it online um i've taken a lot of online classes with the virginia wildlife center so, oh my goodness okay covid so, makes us stand I know. outside sorry, sorry guys so uh i like i take a lot of online classes with the virginia wildlife center um, so even though they're our neighbors in the state yes. of Virginia, they're, um, they have great online classes that they offer throughout the summer. Um, that one's not a free class. You do pay for it, but it's a great resource too for anybody interested in it or um, even veterinarians who just want to know more, who like, you know, maybe they can take stuff and they're just trying to figure out how can I be helping. Um, so that's a great resource for anybody who's not used to working with those species. That's so, so exciting. I take it sometimes just as a reminder, like a refresher. <laughs> so I'm like, Aww. am I doing this right? <laughs> so. It is such a pleasure to meet yeah. you, Jessica. I thank you so much for taking You're your time welcome. for us and for Mary. Yeah. Uh, so, but yeah, I, thanks for caring for Mary. I mean, again, a lot of people wouldn't have done anything. And so, you know, her oh. last moments were very comfortable and, and she knew she was loved and somebody cared for her. So that's, oh. that's always to me like, you know, super special. So even though Mary was a boy. Yeah, Mary is, is Joseph. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay, that, there we go. So thank you so much, everyone. I wanted to give you, it's a sad update, but yeah. it's, it's an Sorry. update that he, he uh, lived probably a, his, almost oh, his yeah. longevity, and right? Yeah, yeah, and you know, at least he's, he's an older possum. He's been around for probably at least four to five years. And so he's, he's probably reproduced a couple times. He's probably got generations out there. Um, so, you yeah. know, I mean. And least, their longevity is not oh, it's, very, very. No, it's not. They don't live to be that old. Um, so unfortunately, they have a short lifespan. They're just. Yes, yeah, so. we got it. But well, that's why they reproduce so much that they have so many babies every time because their their you know numbers are shorter. So well, we'll be looking for uh, Mary Joseph's yeah, yeah. Uh, offspring. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, thank you so much, yeah, Jessica. I appreciate welcome. you. Yeah. All right.